Hello friends. So today we are going to discuss about the properties of synapse. So in our last class, we discussed about the organization of uh, the nervous system and we started few features of synapses, right? So while reading synapses, we saw that there are two types of uh, synapses as per the physiological classification. One of them is electrical synapse, the other one is chemical synapse. Okay. The chemical synapse has different set of properties as compared to electrical synapse. Now, so, so this, uh, these properties of synapse which we are referring to here, they are primarily for the chemical synapses. Okay. So this you have to keep in mind. So the first property which we are referring to is one-way conduction. Right? So by one-way conduction, I just mean to say if this is a neuron and this is another neuron, so this is first degree neuron, this is second degree neuron, here and it is presynaptic, so this would be post-synaptic. Right? If this is the synapse here, so the transmission will always be from one to two only transmission will not be transmission will not be okay so trans transmission will not be vice versa so it is only one way conduction Simple to understand. Right? This is the feature of chemical synapse only. So, point here to note is that electrical synapse, if you talk of electrical synapse, they have two way communication, two way conduction. Okay, so they can, uh, they are the ones which can have the uh, both the uh, conduction ways that is from first to second and second to first as well second property is synaptic delay so second property is synaptic delay we also read about this see if let us say this is presynaptic area presynaptic membrane and this is post synaptic membrane so what are the things which are happening here there is this action potential which is coming right there's this action potential which is coming the mitochondria are uh, there inside this the mitochondria are there inside this right? then Just hold on, please. There are these calcium channels. So calcium will come in. Right? Calcium will come in. So from the arrival of action potential here to the production of EPSP or IPSP, whatever it is, EPSP in the post synaptic this is pre synaptic this is post synaptic so coming off from coming off uh, action potential in the pre synaptic membrane to the uh, commencement of epsp in the post synaptic membrane refers to synaptic delay so what are the reasons for delay the reasons include the neurotransmitter which is now released here right neurotransmitter release it also will include like for example these are uh, receptors on the post synaptic membrane so there would be the receptor channels on which first uh, this neurotransmitter will get attached then the uh, channel will be opened up and then sodium or calcium this is going to come in and once sodium calcium comes in there would be this epsp which would be produced so 
in all these things uh, there is some time which is involved normally this time is to the tune of 0.5 millisecond so for one synapse it is nearly 0.5 millisecond so for any see synapses majorly are found in reflexes right so reflexes they do have synapse and reflexes can be <coughs> classified on the basis of categorized on the basis of number of synapses so for example reflexes can be monosynaptic you know this right then bisynaptic or disynaptic and also polysynaptic so <clears throat> why i am telling you here is because the synaptic delay is approximately 0.5 milliseconds so for a monosynaptic reflex the normal the normal duration uh, from efferent to uh, afferent that is for example let us say if this is your spinal cord right and this is for example this is the afferent this is the efferent for uh, this reflex and here this is the synapse so this is a single synapse right so from afferent to efferent it will take nearly 0.5 or just little more than 5.5 milliseconds right if it is taking approximately 1 milliseconds or just little more than 1 millisecond it has to be a bisynaptic if it is taking more than this much more than 1 millisecond it has to be a polysynaptic reflex so the duration between the afferent and efferent uh, this uh, impulse to come can also tell you about the type of reflex it is right monosynaptic bisynaptic or polysynaptic synaptic delays uh, at one single synapse is approximately 0.5 this is uh, this delay basically i am talking of is in the faster type of uh, synapses right anyways okay so let us come to next okay now let us talk of summation now by summation what do you mean to say uh, we have already read about summation although see by summation i mean to say that at the post synaptic let us say this is the pre synaptic membrane and this is the post synaptic membrane right so at the post synaptic membrane there are the there are various type of receptor channels which are there so whenever there is this receptor i'm sorry this is a zero transmitter which is coming and getting attached to these what happens there is this sodium or either calcium which comes in this i am talking of an excitatory neurotransmitter okay so there would be small epsp which is formed here another epsp here another epsp here another epsp here right so 
all these EPSPs ultimately will add up. And by adding, they will, by adding simply means they will sum up and they will lead to the formation of an action potential. So EPSPs are local potentials, right? And by adding, by summing up, they might lead to action potentials. Now it might happen that there is EPSP here and there is, let us say, another type of uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter releasing uh, thing which is there. So which is creating basically in one of there, it is creating an IPSP, inhibitory postsynaptic potential because of this inhibitory neurotransmitter. Then the resultant would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 EPSPs plus 1 IPSP. Then in that case, it might not lead to action potential. Okay, So it is almost, you can say it's algebraic sum of all the EPSPs and IPSPs. Okay, you can just take the summation like this as well. For example, let us say this is a neuron, right? There in, in this neuron, just try to understand this. There are, let us say, there are these presynaptic, uh, many multiple presynaptic uh, neurons which are attaching there, right? So what is happening now is that there is one EPSP being generated here, there is being one EPSP generated here, another here, another here. So just try to understand this, that these EPSPs are being generated at different spaces, right? They are generated at different spaces. By different spaces, I mean to say, different parts of the cell membrane of the uh, neuron right or different you can say uh, different areas of the soma different spaces or different areas right if they are being generated at different spaces still what happens at the initial segment this is the initial segment just near to this is also exon, uh, exon hillock, right? So exon hillock is actually here. This is exon hillock. And this is the initial segment of the exon, right? So what usually happens? that at initial segment, that at initial segment, you find that all these EPSPs, they are summated and they will produce this action potential ultimately. Okay. So here in what is happening at the same time, so there are two points here important. At one single time, on different areas or different spaces, there are inputs which are coming and they basically are now summated. They will lead to action potential. So what type of summation is this? This is simply called as by space, it, it will known as spatial, spatial or spatial summation. Because this lead, uh, this refers to special, the word special has come from spaces. So at different spaces together, firing is happening, which is leading to addition of these, leading to action potential. Okay? There can be a similar situation. So this is a special summation, one important type of summation. There can be another situation, just taking an example. This is uh, another neuron, right? 
and let us say there are these <coughs> neurons uh, the i'm just now just taking example of let us say there is one single presynaptic neuron here right which is coming and giving the impulse onto one part of the dendrite or stoma and this is the post synaptic cell right post synaptic membrane here and but important thing here is this gives the signal again and again multiple times the signal is given so multiple times the signal is given okay but by one single presynaptic neuron which ultimately will lead to what every time a uh, epsp is formed there would be one epsp then uh, just after that another epsp just after that another epsp just after that another epsp so all of them will also be uh, leading to summation see if you see multiple times i mean to say the time is different so subsequent stimulus may be after few milliseconds one or two milliseconds after the first one so if that is happening again and again and again and again what is going to happen there would be multiple epsp which will be produced and which will lead to still lead to summation this would be known as temporal summation why temporal the word temporal has come from time so time is important okay. so subsequently frequently multiple stimulus are coming still summation is happening now summation see why is summation happening the you know the fluid inside the soma that is so so that soma is such that uh, the cytoplasm of the soma is such that there is equitable distribution of charge so whatever charge is here the same charge would be at the initial segment or exon hillock and this distribution of charge it happens extremely fast extremely extremely fast so that is the reason uh, the sodium channels would be opened up in the initial segment and then initial segment will have action potential okay understood so this is temporal summation fine so these are the two type of summations we read about uh, these earlier as well so these are two type of summations just a second Okay. Now, let us now talk of the fourth property, which was occlusion. Now, what is occlusion now? Let us try to understand occlusion by a simple line diagram. Let us say these are uh, this. These are two different neurons. This is neuron A. its exon is giving multiple branches let us say five branches okay and they are now getting they are now getting uh synapsed with five different neurons fine right? now just take an example this is neuron b which also is giving different branches 3 4 and 5 
somewhat like this. Got it? So just try to understand this now. Now what is happening? If you now see, if you discharge A or if you give impulse via A, then what is happening? One, two, three, four, and five. If you discharge or if you give this impulse via A, there would be these five of the uh, you know postsynaptic uh, neurons which are excited. Five neurons are excited. If you give charge to, if you give uh, this, what do you call it, uh, discharge via B, again, if you see, there are one, two, three, four, and five. The five, uh, they are discharging now. Now, just try and understand what is going to happen if both of them are excited together. If you do A plus B together simultaneously, Now what is happening? How many of them are there now? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So because they are only connect, they are connected only to 8 uh, postsynaptic neurons, so a maximum of 8 only can be uh, discharged. Uh, the impulse can be transferred to only these many. So see, by simultaneous discharging of these two presynaptic neurons, what is happening now? That Earlier it were coming out to be 5 plus 5, 10, and now it is coming out to be 8. So two neurons are occluding here. Two neurons are occluded. Okay, so this is referred to as occlusion, and this is again a property of very important property of synapses. Right? So if you have, let's try to now understand this. If you have such neurons which are having impulses or which are having synapses from two different presynaptic neurons, these, they may behave uh, to be excited via any one of them. So if both of them are together uh, excited, then also they will be excited only once, not twice. So this is occlusion, right? Little related one, however, uh, is subliminal. Fringe. Subliminal fringe. It is almost opposite to occlusion. See, sometimes what happens that let us say this is again neuron A, okay, and this is giving. Again, few branches. Let us say three branches are like this. And why I am making dotted branches? I'll just let you know. Okay. Let us say this is B, and this is also giving similar branches. I'll just let you know what is dotted here and what is solid line here. See, <clears throat> and now let's just see. If A is discharged, if A is giving signal, these three will have action potential. AP, AP, and AP. So they will all be discharged, completely discharged action potential. However, if only A is uh, discharged in these two postsynaptic membrane, uh, most postsynaptic neurons, 
only EPSP are produced and not the complete action potential. Got it? So they are so connected with uh, either A or either B that any one of these will not lead to the excitation of these two. Let us say this, this is X and this is Y. So now X and Y, they are so connected to uh, A or B that only excitation of A or only excitation of B will not lead to the complete action potential in them. However, if A and B, if A and B together are discharged, it will lead to EPSP plus EPSP, which will ultimately lead to action potential, definitely. Got it? Because EPSPs uh, will have summation. Okay. So now mathematically, we just try to understand this. So this is the situation. Now what is happening? If let us say A is only discharged, if only A is discharged, what? How many neurons is it is exciting? One, two, and three. Okay. If only B is discharged, how many of neurons? Are excited post synaptic neurons again three they in three complete action potential is happening and in two only EPSP is happening right likewise for B also so ultimately if you see it is only six action potentials which are which can be seen if you uh, you know if you excite either A or either B. However, now, if simultaneously, now it's easy to understand, if simultaneously, now you, ex uh, you know, excite A and B, then you see, even for X and Y, action potential will be formed. So, they are not now, they will lead to excitation of all of them. So, how, how many of them are there now? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, right? So if you see here, earlier it was 6 action potentials, now there are 8 action potentials which are coming. So herein, there is benefit. So benefit of simultaneously exciting. So this phenomenon is known as subliminal fringe, fine? Very important. Now let us talk of another one. Another property. It is known as convergence. It is the very, it is a very very basic property. Uh, convergence and divergence, very very basic property. I'll just let you know. What do you mean by convergence? Con convergence simply means there are many uh, things coming together and converging, right? So this is convergence. The same thing is happening here. So if let us say this is one neuron, this is one neuron, this is one neuron, and they they are ultimately giving discharge or uh, synapting onto let us say this one neuron. This would be known as convergence. Got it? Likewise, what is divergence now? In the previous examples, I told you about divergence, right? See, herein what was happening? This A was actually diverging, one, two, three, right? B was also diverging. So this is a simple example of B, uh, of divergence. One neuron, its exon, they are basically giving this is divergence. A very simple example, right? Okay. So what happens basically? What is the benefit of convergence and divergence? Now just try to see this. In convergence, what is happening? In convergence, many neurons are exciting and ultimately due to these many neurons, only one of the neuron is getting excited, right? So many presynaptic neurons converge on any single post-synaptic neuron. Right? So where does this happen? See in spinal motor, motor neurons, in spinal motor neurons. What happens? Some input come directly from the dorsal root. 
some are coming from the uh, long descending spinal tracts and some are coming from interneurons so this arrangement actually it permits more effective stimulation or inhibition of the postsynaptic neuron ultimately uh, these will decide one two three they will decide whether you need to have a positive uh, output here or a negative output here by negative output i mean to say no action potential right hyperpolarization so this is pretty common in spinal motor neurons right sometimes what happen the exon of the presynaptic neurons they divide into many branches as i told you in uh, this is happening in divergence so like for example sensory signals are related on to several regions of the brain so this basically in sensory neurons it's pretty common and what happens this arrangement will amplify the signal right this will amplify the signal like for example if you have a pin prick pin prick what all things will you do if it's a very severe one Uh, there are two three things which definitely all of us uh, will do one is uh, that we'll just stretch back our uh, hand right we'll just take our hand away from pin second or almost all of us will do uh, will have uh, will be in pain so we'll feel pain so see ultimately motor connection is also there and you see uh, the sensory connection is also there and also emotional connection is also there because you will feel pain and you some of you might at least say ouch or some of you may also start crying right so how is all that possible it's all possible because of divergence so to amplify the signal to let the whole of the brain know okay so for example if uh, pain is there if a person is sleeping and you induce some sort of pain for example you just slap them what will happen he will feel the pain he will uh, so sensory he will be irritated okay and he will wake up by wake up almost his whole of the brain would be active so almost reticular form uh, through reticular formation he will be active so divergence property of divergence is uh, definitely coming handy there right okay next is after convergence and divergence uh, number 8 property which we noted is fatigue so what is fatigue and why is fatigue happening the fatigue the most common site of fatigue is synapse and neuromuscular junction which is almost a kind of synapse right so <clears throat> what is the mechanism Uh, there can be more than one mechanism of uh, this fatigue one of the mechanism is see repeated stimulation of presynaptic if the there, there is repeated uh, stimulation of the presynaptic neurons it will lead to gradual decrease and disappearance decrease and disappearance of the post synaptic response this is referred to as fatigue right this is known as synaptic fatigue okay this is synaptic fatigue or also uh, another name for this is habituation okay so another name for this is habituation just so what can be the reason of this fatigue there can be two reasons for this either there is exhaustion of uh, this chemical transmitters which are there neurotransmitters or chemical transmitters this in fact is one of the most important reason what can be the other reason right second is gradual inactivation of this mind it it is gradual 
inactivation of the calcium channels right so which will what will uh, the inactivation of calcium channel do it will decrease the intracellular calcium if intracellular calcium is decreased what is going to happen from the presynaptic terminal there would be no release of chemical <coughs> transmitters and there can be third reason for uh, this also there can be accumulation of waste products okay there can also be fourth there can also be refractoriness at the level of post synaptic membrane why will refractiveness happen at uh, post synaptic membrane sometimes there is invagination of uh, this receptors also okay so these are basically the reasons at pre synaptic membrane and this is at post synaptic membrane okay and that is the reason of uh, what do you call it the fatigue right so synapse and neuromuscular junctions they are the most common site of fatigue see what usually happens you also have uh, must have observed till now that when will you be able to perform better when you uh, th there is first condition when you had a okay okay if not very good okay night sleep or the second condition is see the main condition is there is examination right so there is examination and there is one person or same you you had a proper night sleep at least 4 5 hours of sleep you replenished your neurotransmitters okay they are replenished vis a vis second condition is you had a sleepless night your uh, neurotransmitters they are all gone they are all absent now they are consumed now so obviously in exam this person because the neurotransmitters are definitely there so his memory will be better he will be able to perform better so this is definitely better while sleepless nights they usually are not that good okay and the example is habituation or the fatigue at the level of uh, synapses okay now the next uh, property of uh, the synapses that is facilitation so this is uh, i think property number 9 this is facilitation so what is facilitation by facilitation i mean to say that let us say this is one neuron uh this is our second neuron post synaptic one okay and what usually happens there are these whenever this comes uh the action potential comes what hap what happens there is calcium channel which open and there is this calcium which comes in right so when calcium comes in let us say there is this first action potential which comes fine if just after first action potential uh, you know almost immediately after first action potential there is second action potential which comes what is going to happen the calcium has a cycle basically so if there is this calcium now inside and before even calcium going back if there is more action potential comes and there is there are more uh, calcium which comes in there would be accumulation of calcium so the second action potential will be facilitated now okay so second action potential will be facilitated now and this facilitation is because of 
very important. It is because of the residual calcium which is there. Fine. It is because of the residual calcium. Fine. So this is uh, referred to as facilitation. Okay. A very simple thing to understand, right? <clears throat> okay. Now, let us come over to the next property, which is after discharge. See, sometimes what happens if there is a single instantaneous input discharge this is these words are important there is single instantaneous input discharge this can also lead to sustained output discharge how is it possible how is it possible this is possible in case of divergence actually see if this is the one neuron and this is giving uh you know action potential or this is given yeah this is given basically uh, this is giving action potential to multiple other neurons then there can be the sustained output discharge in multiple uh, you know multiple discharges after one single instantaneous input discharge this is known as after discharge okay? next property is reverberation See what is reverberation? Uh, how does when does it happen? It's pretty simple. Let us say there is this one neuron which is there, and it is giving discharge to another neuron. Right? This is our second neuron, which has. Uh, so this is given uh, giving action potential positive one. So there is this action potential which is again generated in the second one. However this exon can have a branch which ultimately can have same discharge that is positive discharge for the first one so this is a and this is b a is exciting b and b is again now discharging or uh, you can say polarizing uh, depolarizing a again so because of this formation there would be repetition of the action potential or repetition of the discharge basically so this would be known as nothing but reverberation so this is a reverberation circuit right <clears throat> okay now let us talk of the synaptic plasticity What do you mean by plasticity? See, what is elasticity and what is plasticity? If there is this coil, let us say if you stretch it, what is going to happen? It will stretch out, however, so it, it might stretch to this much. When there is no, this force is not there, it will again regain its shape right so this is elastic opposite to this is plastic so what is plastic plastic is moldable okay so plastic simply means 
capability of being changed or capability of being molded that is plasticity okay so <clears throat> when is uh, when when uh, when will the synapse change it will basically change based on the past experience based on past experience so if you get if you get a learning from some past experience that is known as in simple terms that is known as learning in memory right so basically synaptic plasticity is nothing but you can say basics basis of learning in memory as far as synapse is concerned right so synapse synaptic conduction can be increased or decreased on the basis of past experience these changes can be pre synaptic or can be post synaptic in location Obviously, they play an important role in learning, as I told you. That is in conditioned reflexes. So <clears throat> they are very important for conditioned reflexes. Okay. So what are the uh, forms of synaptic plasticity? forms of synaptic plasticity first type is post tetanic potentiation so what do we mean by post tetanic potentiation see if there is a brief tetanizing stimulus okay and this tetanizing stimulus is uh, if there is it has to be brief this is important if there is brief tetanizing stimulus and this is on you know pre synaptic neuron fine so what is it going to do it is definitely going to increase the production of post synaptic potentials right it is going to increase the production of post synaptic potentials so this is post tetanic potentiation i'll just uh, make you understand by a simple diagram let us say this is pre synaptic membrane okay and this is our neuron so this is post synaptic and this is pre synaptic fine so if there is this uh, you know if there is tetanizing frequency which is coming here that means again and again and again and again it is coming what is going to happen there would be lot and lot of calcium here right and this calcium basically it will lead to the increased response basically the response will be potentiated so there would be many new, uh, neurotransmitters which, which would be released and therefore there would be a uh, lot and lot of sodium which will ultimately come in and lot of potentials which will come in for a longer duration of time right so this is post tetanic potentiation fine so one brief tetanizing frequency of potentials will lead to prolonged little prolonged uh, you know output you can say in the post synaptic uh, membrane also what happens if this post synaptic potentiation get really prolonged for hours or days this is known as long term potentiation
So long term potentiation refers to if the post tetanic potentiation is prolonged. So it is long term potentiation. Okay. And why is it there? It is there because of the increase in the again intracellular calcium where in post synaptic or pre synaptic in post synaptic block. So post synaptic potentiation is so this was post synaptic. Sorry, this is pre synaptic. This is pre synaptic and this is post tetanic potentiation. So, post tetanic potentiation is the site is site of calcium accumulation is pre synaptic membrane and in long term potentiation, the site of uh, calcium accumulation is post synaptic uh, intracellular I and mean post synaptic uh, membrane, you can say. Right? So, in the post synaptic neuron. There is increased calcium. Right? So this is the difference. Where does it happen? Very commonly, it happens in hippocampus. So just to summarize, there are two types of potentiation. One is post tetanic potentiation, right? Post technique potentiation simply refers to if there is a brief potenti uh, potential, but technique potential is coming in the pre synaptic membrane, there is in it leads to increased calcium or calcium accumulation in pre synaptic terminal. And if it is prolonged, it is lead, uh, it is said as long term potentiation, post technique potentiation. And long term potentiation it is there when there is increased calcium accumulation in post synaptic cell okay. so that is a little different okay what is uh, long term depression now long this is long term potentiation there is another thing which is known as long term uh, depression there is a very important difference in these two let's try to understand this see if if the stimulus is if the stimulus is you know uh, not injurious is non injurious or it's not harmful then there is this no, long term depression which happens if the stimulus is injurious then there is this potentiation which happens not the point this is also known as sensitization So sensitization is uh, some books says that it is same as long term potentiation. However, in a few books, it is just uh, given as a little different one. Sensitization is also known as pre synaptic facilitation. Pre synaptic facilitation. So if there is one transient response which is coming, and therefore, thereafter, there is another uh, stimulus which is coming just after the initial stimulus, then sensitization is uh, occurring. It's happening. Okay. It's again uh, due to the calcium mediated uh, changes. Uh, however, in sensitization, especially, it is believed that there is the cyclic AMP which is involved in sensitization. Right. So long term depression or habituation are again almost the same thing. So if simultaneous stimulation are given, uh, then over a period of time, uh, the response is decreased. So subsequently, so for example, if you have to study right and there is some background noise, which is there some humming noise or 
let us say tv is running on in another room but you are health focused to study then what is going to happen is because the stimulus is non injurious so your mind will automatically not react to this this non injurious stimulus over a period of time that is depression if the voice is uh, if the voice is so high so harmful the noise then or otherwise if there is some sore which is happening then it might happen that the post ethnic potentiation will uh, happen So this is uh, about the uh, what do you call it uh, the synaptic plasticity and just try to understand this that in all these examples if you see the previous learning is coming into picture right the previous learning is coming into picture whether it's injurious or non injurious whether previously calcium is there or not there whether it's a presynaptic or postsynaptic uh, neuron however previous learning is uh, happening based on the past experience basically okay. then uh, the last property of uh, this is inhibition okay. this is last but not the least i mean this is the most important there are multiple uh, questions Uh, which do come on inhibition okay see inhibition can be uh, of two types it can be if let us say this is pre synaptic and this is post synaptic membrane obviously you can inhibit the pre synaptic membrane you can inhibit the post synaptic membrane and can have inhibition of the synapse ultimately so inhibition can be pre synaptic inhibition or post synaptic inhibition simple these two types we will first study about the post synaptic inhibition see when we talk of post synaptic inhibition we talk of first of all we talk of direct inhibition now what is direct inhibition see the inhibition which will result uh, due to stimulation of afferent nerve okay which passes directly to the motor neuron in the spinal cord thus post synaptic inhibition during the course of an IPSP is known as direct inhibition, right? Because ultimately, if you see, it is not due to the discharge of the previous postsynaptic uh, neuron discharge, right? Like for example, uh, let us say this is the one. This is uh, obviously presynaptic, and this is post synaptic and what is happening now this is the excitatory neuron which is coming here right and let us say this is there is this i'll just make try to make this in red there is another discharge which is negative discharge which is coming directly to the post synaptic uh, membrane so ultimately if this was making one epsp what will this make this will make ipsp okay and then epsp will be nullified by this ipsp okay right? so this is about direct inhibition okay this is about direct inhibition which is what which is happening basically now let us take the example this is just this scheme scheme which is there now we'll also discuss the example you might have heard of golgi bottle neuron these are interneurons which are there okay. see muscle spindles uh, you have uh, heard about muscle spindles right if the muscle spindle of an extensor muscle is stimulated 
by stretching the muscle this will lead to contraction right the reflex contraction of the muscle itself so what happens you have already studied this i suppose it basically happens in first example is uh, in a spinal cord it happens as postsynaptic uh, inhibition I'm, i'm just giving the example see what happens if there is this muscle spindle right of an extent uh, in, important thing is of an extensor muscle this will lead to if this is like stimulated this will lead to reflex contraction of the same muscle and reflex relaxation of the antagonistic muscle so if extensor muscle is uh, stimulated muscle spindle is uh, stimulated so the same will have contraction and there would be reflex relaxation of the uh, antagonistic muscle how is it happening it is basically happening by a simple uh, you know simple process of postsynaptic inhibition i'll just tell you with the help of a diagram now let us say this is our spinal cord okay and this is uh we just make it with multicolor let us say let us say this is uh, the extensor muscle uh this is extensor extensor muscles and ultimately the bones are involved right so this is one bone this is another bone let's see right so this is the flexor muscle this is the extensor muscle which is there right so what happens if this extensor muscle is stimulated there there is this extensor muscle which is stimulated there would be by uh by this greenish blue i'll make by this i'll make the stimulating now this is stimulated right it will ultimately have a synapse with the ventral root uh right and i'll just let me make it first this is this is one interneuron you can see this is one interneuron the name of this interneuron is golgi wattle neuron right and what does this release this release glycine okay Thank <laughs> you. 
okay so if the, let us say this was a positive signal which was coming and this is uh here the drg basically the dorsal uh, root ganglion right this is the dorsal horn uh this is coming the signal is coming via here it is going into dorsal horn and it's coming uh, on the ventral aspect and there are two uh you know uh, branches of exon which is happening or it is giving input one directly to uh, this you know uh, one to the interneuron that is golgi wattle uh, ganglion and one to this basically right so what is now happening there is one excited tree input which is coming here right and this excitatory input ultimately via this interneuron is converted into a inhibitory uh, you know what do you call it uh, signal leading to the relaxation of the flexor muscle so this is the function of an interneuron golgi wattle uh, neuron which is releasing glycine basically right so this is how uh, there is this uh you know uh post synaptic but uh this inhibition which is happening here right you can also give the example of golgi tendon organ this also you have read i suppose right so what happens in golgi tendon organ uh, inhibition just make the diagram again now okay let us say this is the flexor muscle which is there right and this is giving I'll just make this by this blue color. It is giving signal here, right? And because of this interneuron, which is an inhibitory interneuron, right? This, there's this inhibitory interneuron. This interneuron is basically leading to. inhibition of this the opposite antagonistic muscle right which is reciprocal inhibition this is nothing but reciprocal inhibition okay but this we just studied this we just read there is another thing which is also happening let us say there are two type of fibers which are there one a fiber and one b fiber which are there one a fibers are coming from the muscle per se right and one b fibers they are coming from gto this you have read golgi tendon organ right we'll again uh, read this in the chapter of reflexes don't worry about it much i'll just again make you understand this so that two one a and also one b which is coming right these two are coming basically the motor neuron let us say this is the motor neuron here right the motor neuron is going to the same muscle this is not antagonistic muscle this is the same muscle fine now what happens there is this in one interneuron which is there one interneuron which is there and this interneuron basically is inhibitory okay this normal this is one a basically right 
this one a fiber ultimately it also gets a synapse onto this motor neuron so this is motor neuron this is sensory neuron <coughs> golgi tendon organ neuron 1b the only thing is that the threshold for 1b golgi tendon organ neuron is high okay so if this is high see this is basically a protective reflex so what happens if you are doing weight lifting if you're doing just try to understand this if you're doing weight lifting heavy weight lifting so ultimately what is going to happen your the moment uh, you think of uh, lifting weight your uh, ultimately motor response will happen and this what do you call it uh, muscle it would be contracted right so muscle contraction will happen however if the weight is extremely heavy and there is a risk that your muscle will tear action what happens golgi tendon organ gets excited 1b gets discharged and via this interneuron this interneuron is here via this interneuron directly on the post synaptic uh, this post synaptic uh, neuron or, or the motor neuron there is this direct inhibition which is happening and due to this due to this innervation there is relaxation you might have seen uh, in tv the very very heavy weight lifters what do they do they they try to you know uh, put up the weight let us say the weight is 150 kg he is trying to uh, lift it up from the ground and if he is not able to lift up to the full extent to his head what happens with a jolt with with within a second what happens there is this dropping of the weight which happens and this dropping of the weight is due to this golgi tendon organ and this is due to this uh, ipsp which is being produced by this interneuron okay this is this interneuron releasing the inhibitory mediated uh, inhibitory uh, this peptide uh, uh, inhibitory uh, signal therefore leading to the uh, what do you call it inhibition right? okay now we talked of uh, the direct inhibition so what did uh, we mean by direct inhibition direct inhibition is simply the post synaptic inhibition another example was golgi tendon organ inhibition now let us talk of the indirect inhibition what do you mean by indirect inhibition now see indirect inhibition can be of you know many types like for example if let us say this is pre synapsis this is, this is post synaptic uh, cell so what is happening one inhibition can be uh, the post synaptic uh, cell is refractory so if there is it is a refractory refractory okay because it has just fired so it is now refractory so that that can be one of the reasons for indirect inhibition right it can also be uh, in a state of after hyperpolarization if it is in a state of after hyperpolarization what is going to happen nothing is going to happen right it can be uh, the third type of uh, this inhibition can be renshaw cell inhibition now this is important and this is asked also what is renshaw cell inhibition see it is pretty simple what happens this is another name for this is negative feedback inhibition renshaw cell inhibition is nothing but negative feedback inhibition so basically neurons will give a negative feedback to themselves this is basically negative feedback to themselves okay so how do they do let us say this is again your 
uh, spinal cord, right? And this is the ventral horn. This is the dorsal horn. This is the ventral horn, right? And here there is a motor neuron which is there, right? So herein there is a Renshaw cell, which is Renshaw cell is inhibitory. Renshaw cell is basically inhibitory interneuron. It is nothing but inhibitory interneuron, right? So what it does, let us say a motor neuron is there is this motor neuron and it is given it is giving out one excitatory input down to this is motor neuron, right? So this is giving an excitatory signal. However, its exon might give out a branch which is connected to this is important just try to see this this is now connected to the Renshaw cell this is now connected to a negative cell this is nothing but Renshaw cell and this is nothing but negative so what will it give this motor neuron is excited it gives out a positive signal it gives out another branch to the Renshaw cell, which is inhibitory. So, this is going to give back the signal to this motor nerve. Therefore, this is a negative feedback inhibition. Simple. Right? And where are these Renshaw cells situated? They are inhibitory interneurons, which are situated in the ventromedial part of in the ventromedial. I just made it. For your convenience, I made it in here, right? So this is uh, ventral and medial part, right? So this is here, ventromedial part of of the ventral horn. So there are inhibitory interneurons in the ventromedial part of the ventral horn, and they send out the exons to the uh, inhibitory exons to the motor neurons right so basically they just give feedback which is usually negative feedback and Renshaw cell they are you know excited by Renshaw cells are uh, these are about Renshaw cells they are stimulated or excited by nothing but acetylcholine which is a positive uh, one usually right There are few sim uh, similar connections or sim similar inhibitions via collaterals, which are there in the cerebral cortex and, and the limbic system also. Okay. Fine. So we talked about uh, the direct inhibition, right? So we were talking about postsynaptic inhibition. Still here, in if you see, this is nothing but postsynaptic inhibition only, right? So it can be direct or indirect inhibition. So direct inhibition mein kya tha? Direct in inhibition mein on the, directly on the postsynaptic membrane, there were inhibiting uh, inhibition which was happening. In indirect inhibition of the postsynaptic membrane, what was happening? There was either uh, the refractoriness or uh, in the after hyperpolarization or via Renshaw cell that ultimately the postsynaptic membrane is getting uh, hyperpolarized or uh, you can say inhibited. Now let us talk of the presynaptic inhibition. Let us talk of the presynaptic inhibition. This is, I would say, simpler. Okay. So it is again extremely easy to understand. So you are not concerned here. You are more concerned now at the presynaptic uh, membrane or presynaptic terminal. So without even before even the signal reaches to the synapse there is inhibition which is happening so it usually happens in it can happen in exo synapses okay 
so the afferent fiber which is coming that can give that can influence uh, each other by means of collaterals which uh, which can innervate the uh, you know interneurons these will then form connections with the presynaptic terminals of the other afferent uh, fibers for example if this is uh, one you can have another one which is coming here and giving a negative uh, you know signal to the presynaptic uh, terminal okay so this is about uh, how this presynaptic inhibition is happening now this can be like uh, via interneuron this can be via collateral right any one of these can uh, lead to the this uh, decreased response okay just taking an example here now let us now again make our spinal cord let us make this dorsal horn ventral horn one of the neuron is coming here okay just try to now understand this this is interneuron and see see now this is inhibitory interneuron right this is inhibiting but there is the synapse there is a synapse between these two that means they are almost you can say collaterals this a and b they are collaterals right they are actually coming from one from flexor muscle the other one from the extensor muscle okay and these signals are coming the sensory signals are coming and the, because of this inhibitory interneuron in between which is getting synapsed onto this b okay so ultimately the discharge here that is decreased and there is decreased response here. okay so this is pretty simple what is the mechanism how can uh, uh, this happen if presynaptic see what are the things which are happening pre in presynaptic membrane or presynaptic terminal one was atp which was required right the other one was calcium which was required okay so mitochondria was providing uh, atp and the action potential was leading to opening up of the voltage gated calcium channels right so what happens if there is this inhibition here it can lead to decrease in the action potential so therefore there would be decrease in the uh, opening up of calcium channels right this can happen this can be decrease opening directly right or this can be owing to increased permeability increase permeability to hyperpolarizing things what do you mean by hyperpolarizing now it can be increased permeability for chloride channels or increased permeability for potassium uh, channels okay so what will this lead to this will lead to decrease action potential and 
uh, if this exportation has decreased, I, I mean to say that number of exchange potentials are decreased, there would be less calcium. If there's less calcium, there would be less neurotransmitter which is released. If there's less neurotransmitter, there would be uh, less conduction overall, you can say. Fine. There can be third type. These are how, uh, you know, uh, this inhibition is happening at the presynaptic membrane. So one was uh, this way, the other was by decreasing the uh, increasing the permeability of uh, you know uh, depressing ions, or you can say hyperpolarizing ions. There is chloride and uh, potassium. The third one can be the third way can be the direct inhibition of neurotransmitter release. So there can be direct inhibition of the neurotransmitter release even this can happen right and uh, there can be another thing for example the inhibitory interneuron which was coming it is you know giving a negative uh, i would say a deactivating uh, this uh, neurotransmitter for example gaba it is releasing it is releasing gaba let us say gamma amino butyric acid right if gaba will act on gaba a receptors gaba will act on gaba a receptors okay it will increase the chloride permeability okay leading to uh, what do you call it uh, hyperpolarization okay or inactivation of the presynaptic membrane also if it acts on receptor gaba b it will lead to increased activation of or increased permeability of chloride or sorry potassium so gaba a chloride gaba b potassium right this is basically uh, how an inhibitory interneuron or uh, inhibitory collateral can lead to presynaptic inhibition right see conversely what can happen you can have uh, presynaptic facilitation as well okay likewise you can have presynaptic facilitation also right so that is again uh, one thing which can be there so repolarization will get delayed and it will lead to a uh, continuation of depolar uh, depolarization basically and facilitation can be done by neurotransmitter serotonin this is important so gaba will lead to inhibition and serotonin will lead to presynaptic facilitation right so as such uh, will they help the uh, inhibition and uh, facilitation definitely they help see for example uh, we saw that golgi tendon organ basically gto it was helping for the uh, helping to prevent the tear of the muscle right also if you see there is another type of uh, inhibition which is known as feed forward inhibition this is again very important uh, type of inhibition uh, and in feed forward inhibition what is seen feed forward inhibition is seen in the cerebellum okay so in the cerebellum what is happening in the feed forward inhibition this uh, what do you call it the parallel fibers which are there one is feed forward inhibition is seen in cerebellum First point, right? So, ultimately, what happens in this? See, basket cells which are there. If they are stimulated, if they are stimulated, they lead to production of IPSPs. In the 
porque en Jason. Right? However, however, what happens? The same set of uh, neuron, which was basically, uh, you know, stimulating the basket cell, this also gives a positive, direct positive signal to the Purkinje cell. Fine. So this is feed forward inhibition. Got it? The if basket cells are excited, they will give negative signal or IPSP to Purkinje cell. The same uh, stimulatory fibers, they are giving positive signals to the Purkinje cells. So ultimately, to control this uh, Purkinje cell excitation, basket cell come into picture and it is doing feed forward inhibition of the Purkinje cells. So basket cells are involved in the feed forward inhibition. So they help in limiting the duration of the excitation, which can be produced by uh, one afferent impulse basically. Okay. So this is about the feed forward uh, inhibition in the cerebellum. So these are uh, the basic properties of uh, synapse, uh, which are definitely important, which are uh, pretty commonly asked. Now, I'll just, yeah. Okay. There are a few things which were uh, remaining and uh, which I needed to discuss with you. See, we basically in, in our uh, last class as well. Yeah. We talked about that the ion channels which we have studied till now, they open and close for, you know, very, very small amount of time. So ultimately what happens, uh, if you have to form memory, these milliseconds will not work. So you need to either have reverberating circuits, which we just studied today, or you need to have some different mechanism, right? So there, there has to have prolonged the post synaptic neural excitation or either inhibition for this memory to uh, form. So what and how can be done? So for the same, we have, Two second messenger systems. So second messenger systems refer to uh, they are the they are a set of uh, molecules, signaling molecules, which basically release uh, some you know uh, some uh, a series of chain basically, which lead to a change of uh, either the atmosphere inside the cell or lead to formation of new proteins or something like that. So ultimately. If you talk of uh, the, you know, second messengers, so there are these signaling molecules which are first messengers. So what are first messengers? For example, acetylcholine can be first messenger. And what are second messengers? Second messengers can be via this G protein coupled receptor or system. So we'll just read about them in brief. However, we will read them in detail again in endocrine as well as uh, in CNS. Also, we have read this already. Right? So G protein coupled receptor, uh, CMP system, uh, phosphenocetol, tonic acid uh, pathway or system. So these are all the examples. This is the example of G protein coupled receptor, GPCR. This is the receptor protein. This is G protein coupled receptor. There is this G protein here. G protein has three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma, as you can see. This is as of now inactivated and it has GTP attached with it. The moment there is this neurotransmitter which comes here, there, there occurs activation in this G protein. There is this GTP which replaces this GDP here 
right? So triphosphate is replaced by diphosphate ultimately, and uh, the moment it is done, uh, basically, it was first, you know, attached here. It was first attached here. Now the moment it is done, basically GTP is attached to this, and, and the moment alpha unit subunit gets energy, it gets detached. So the moment it gets energy from GTP, alpha subunit will get detached. If this alpha subunit is detached, now what all it can do? Now it is active to do functions. The alpha subunit earlier was attached to the beta and gamma subunits. They were all one single uh, molecule, a protein, which is G protein. And as of now, what is happening? Alpha subunit has detached after attaching to GTP, or after gaining energy, basically, you can say. So what all things can uh, it can do? First, it can open some other ion channels, like for example, potassium channel can be open, even to red channel can be open. Or second, it can activate few enzymes. What are these enzymes? They are membrane bound enzymes, which can, you know, lead to formation of uh, either CAMP, CGMP, or uh, some other, Formation of some other either energy moieties or protein moieties. Right? So they can also activate the intracellular enzymes. So these intracellular enzymes will lead to uh, various uh, reactions inside the cell. They can also lead to long term actions via gene transcription. And ultimately, some proteins or structural changes, protein formation, structural changes, membrane changes, ultimately, in long term, they can also happen. So G protein coupled receptor, uh, with the help of uh, the uh, the uh, G protein, alpha subunit especially, it leads to a magnitude of actions which can happen. Right? Okay. So this is another uh, you know classification you can say of uh, the neurotransmitter. Few transmitters are known as uh, small or rapid acting transmitters. The other one are known as long acting transmitters. So, uh, these see rapidly acting transmitters, if you say they are featured by the one fact that they are synthesized in presynaptic terminal. This is important. That rapid acting terminals are synthesized at the presynaptic terminal. So, if this is the whole neuron, first neuron. There is this presynaptic, uh, let us say, terminal here, and this is the postsynaptic thing. So these neuron, uh, these rapidly acting ones are synthesized here. Got it? What about the long acting ones? They will be synthesized in the soma, and they will be transported all across to the uh, this terminal knob. So, however, we are right now reading about rapidly acting transmitters. So there are four classes of rapidly acting transmitters. The very first is acetylcholine. How is acetylcholine formed? With the help of this, you uh, know this already from your biochemistry. Acetylcholine esterase and uh, uh, acetyl coenzyme A and choline, and they uh, they are uh, joined with the help of choline acetyl transferase. They form acetylcholine. Also, acetylcholine esterase can lead to its decomposition. Again, acetylcholine can be decomposed or uh, simplified into acetate and choline. This is how acetylcholine is formed, synthesized in the uh, presynaptic terminal. So this is synthesis. And in the synaptic left usually, uh, this is broken down. Then there is this class two. Class two are amines, all the amines. Okay, Dopamine, serotonin, histamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine. They are all the amines which come in class two. Class three are majorly the amino acids, glutamate, aspartate, glycine, GABA, various other amino acids. Class four is nitric oxide. Okay. Now, in brief, we'll just read about these. So acetylcholine is the most important, I would say, it is the most important neurotransmitter in our body. And what are the sites where it is there? It is there in the motor cortex. It is there in the Pyramidal cells. Okay, then basal ganglia. It is there in the motor neurons which innervate the skeletal muscles. It is there in the preganglionic neuron. 
It is there in the post-ganglionic neuron, especially in the parasympathetic nervous system. Or pre-ganglionic, both uh, the, uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, it is uh, this only, acyl ganglion. This is important. Only in some of the post-ganglionic neurons, there is acetylcholine. Otherwise, uh, mostly uh, in the post-ganglionic sympathetic nervous system, it is epinephrine or epinephrine, right? Okay. Important thing here that acetyl acetylcholine usually has a uh, excitatory, you know, effect. Except it has inhibitory effect in the parasympathetic nerve endings, right? For example, in Vegas, what does it do? It inhibits the heart. Right? So this is again a very important question to understand. What about other uh, small neurotransmitters? Like, for example, there is this norepinephrine, right? Norepinephrine is there in uh, brain stem, it's there in uh, hypothalamus, uh, especially locus cerebris, bone scan there. No. So it, it improves the wakefulness, overall uh, wakefulness it increases. Dopamine, we already, uh, you already know it's there in substantia nigra, right? So, We'll read about dopamine in, uh, in definitely in detail in further chapters. Okay. Then glycine. Glycine is there, which is secreted. We today also we uh, saw that it is a negative one, and it is secreted in synapses by interneurons. To interneurons, we just read uh, just some time back only that glycine is secreted in synapses in the spinal cord from the inhibitory interneurons, right? GABA is again, as I told you, GABA is uh, again a negative one. Dopamine is uh, again mostly negative one. Uh, GABA basically, it is uh, secreted by the spinal cord, nerve terminals, the spinal cord, cerebellum, basal ganglia, and many other areas of the cortex. And it can act on chloride channel. It can act on potassium channel also. So it can activate both this chloride channel and potassium channel. Therefore, uh, leading to repolarization or hyperpolarization or decreasing the excitability basically. Glutamate almost always, this is positive. So if you see the red color denotes negativity and uh, blue color here denotes positivity. So glutamate is secreted by presynaptic terminals in the uh, sensory pathways basically. Right, and also in the cerebral cortex. So this is about the neurotransmitters. Last uh, two basically, serotonin and nitric oxide. Now serotonin is important. Serotonin acts as inhibitor of pain pathway. This is important, acts as inhibitor of pain pathway. Okay, so uh, it's inhibitor action basically, uh, it helps controlling the mood of the person as well. Right? And where is it found? It is found in many, many areas, uh, especially in the median raphae nucleus of the brainstem. And ultimately, from there, it projects to uh, many other areas, right? Hypothalamus, mates, it gets projected, and in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, it is there. So, serotonin may be, it is inhibitory of the pain pathways. This is important. Nitric oxide, if I talk about nitric oxide, I have positive it here, Negatively, right? So because nitric oxide ke sare alag type ke functions. Hai. You know nitric oxide is a vasodilator. Because, but now you also must know that it is, it is very important for long-term behavior, long-term memory as well. Right? Nitric oxide is one thing, is, uh, is uh, one uh, neurotransmitter which is not stored in vesicle. Very, very, very important. It's a very important question. This is one neurotransmitter which is not stored in the uh, vesicle. So it is, you know, instantly uh, being formed and instantly diffused out. So direct nitric oxide particles, they are diffusing out rather than uh, they are getting stored in the presynaptic terminals. Right? And what it, it do, uh, what does it do in the postsynaptic neuron? It will change the intracellular functions basically. No. So it is very important for long term. This is important. Is a small neurotransmitter, but it is important for uh, neuronal excitability for a little longer duration. What about slow transmitters? See, no, neuropeptides are known as also known as growth factors. They are also called as 
slow transmitters most of them if you see uh, some of them are hormones and some of them are uh, the related peptides peptides okay so for example from the hypothalamus hypothalamic releasing hormones which are there aerotropin releasing hormone uh, lhrh somatostatin uh, pituitary peptides are there all the pituitary hormones you can see here then there are some peptides which act on the gut cell see, they are they are all uh, the git hormones which are there which you will read in git again and a few other local peptides neuropeptides which are there so basically what do they do they also act on receptor uh, they also act on synapses they also act as receptor uh, as uh, uh, neurotransmitters but they bring about you know longer changes so what do they do they basically acts on second messengers so this is important they basically acts on the uh, second messenger system and via second messenger system because we read in second messenger system there are multiple magnitude of uh, function which the g protein coupled receptor or second messengers can do uh, which include the formation of proteins which include the uh, you know changes in the anatomy physiology of the cell right this is how they basically uh, do so neuropeptide if you see neuropeptide are slow and also one other important thing as i told you with the fast peptides they fast peptides were formed in in the so fast peptides as i told you they, it was formed here right however neuropeptides are formed here they are formed here and they actually go all the way they are transported all the way to the dendrites uh, the the exon end basically right so they are formed in the uh, soma in the cell body obviously they are peptides so they will be formed by ribosomes they will be processed in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, reticulum. final uh, packaging and uh, final modification will be done in the golgi uh, organ right and uh, golgi body sorry and th then they will be packaged in the transmitter vesicles and then uh, then through the exonal streaming or exonal transport they will go all the way to the synaptic terminal right? so other important thing is neuropeptides the quantity of neuropeptides that is released is much less why because they are extremely potent they are extremely potent so um, even the small amount will bring about large change so they are extremely potent so they will bring about huge change or large change and they will bring about this change for prolonged duration of time so this these two things are important they bring about huge change large change and for prolonged duration of uh, time fine so these are about the neuropeptides this we uh, already studied so with this your uh, synapses and neurotransmitters we are done with that okay thank you so in our uh, next class we'll be talking of the sensory system okay thank you guys